This episode is brought to you by Morty, Buzzshot, Cogs, and Patreon supporters like you. Cogs by Clockwork Dog is an easy to use platform for running interactive events, specializing in escape rooms. They have plug and play hardware that seamlessly integrates with their software, so you can create a show with lighting and sound cues, all without having to write a single line of code. Map different kinds of inputs and outputs by building up simple logic steps, which determine what you want to happen and when. Some of the best experiences in the world use COGS, including Phantom Peak in London and The Room in Berlin. Now I've been to The Room and they have the highest standards for immersion, lighting, sound, and automation. And now they're using the COGS platform with custom plugins in all of their newest rooms. The COGS starter set is normally valued at $257, but our listeners can get the starter set today for only 130 with free shipping to the US. You can learn more and purchase your COGS starter set at COGS.show. Use code REPOD at checkout. That's R-E-P-O-D. Link and details in the show notes. Welcome to Reality Escape Pod, your lifeline when you need to get away from the real world. I'm David Spira, alongside my co-host, PG Law. Together, we're exploring immersive gaming from all angles, and we'll be joined by guests who really know their stuff. Today's guest is artist Lonnie Hansen. Since the early 80s, Lonnie has been creating immersive installations around the world, from jaw-dropping Christmas tree sculptures for Neiman Marcus, documented by HGTV, to the evolution of the ball sculpture at Coors Field in Denver, and his current project, The Joyful Immersive World of Camp Christmas. He has been a practitioner of the immersive arts long before we called them immersive. Welcome, Lonnie. Thank you. Thank you, David. It's great to be here. I got to tell you, Lonnie, usually when we're looking over the guest list, trying to decide who we're going to have on the season, there's a bit of a discussion. But when it came to you, this was love at first sight. David and I had gone to the Denver Immersive Gathering and I don't think we were even finished with the tour at Camp Christmas. And we were lucky enough to have you as our tour guide. And David turns to me, he was like, we're having him on the podcast. <laughs> like he knew immediately. <laughs> I'm very honored to be here. It's great. Yeah. And I agreed very fast as well. So in the intro, David calls you an immersive installation artist. Hmm. But when you started, that wasn't a term that was used. So what did people call the work that you did earlier in your career? Oh, wow. At one point, it was interactive merchandising because it was related to retail because we were trying to use retail stores as our theater. Yeah, I was often called an enigma and, <laughs> you know, it was experiential public art. Yeah, it was a lot of things. It wasn't until... Meow Wolf broke the gated admission to fine art installation barrier that the world reopened for me. To look back at it now, I'm very thankful that it happened, but it was a lot of years of me getting gigs because I was in between the museums and the retail stores and the theater I was in between those places and I would get the gigs because I wasn't afraid of that space. It's so funny that it was called interactive merchandising, which from the 80s, that's the context, right? The shopping malls, the gigantic shopping malls were the king. That's where you went to get your entertainment. It was in person, but it was couched in terms of shopping and retail. <laughs> yes, because window dressing used to be a thing. I don't know if you guys know this, but it was Frank Baum who wrote The Wizard of Oz, was the first editor of the first visual display magazine. 
And he would go around the United States teaching general stores how to arrange their goods in their windows and in their stores to cause this interaction and to increase sales. I've read the letter where he resigned saying, my little children's book thing is taking off and I'm going to have to resign (laughs) from being the editor of the window dresser or whatever it was called. That's interesting because isn't The Wizard of Oz a whole parable about the industrialist society anyway? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty funny. So I come out of showbiz. I was one of those horrible performers. I delivered over a thousand singing telegrams in my day. Um, I did (laughs) anything for 25 bucks. So I came out of performance and retail window display and that sort of thing. And that led to costuming and props. So, you know, I was coming from a very weird place, but the, the window dressers, the conventions back in the seventies, Department stores were a big deal, and Windows had masters doing these window displays. We haven't seen anything like it since. Everything just looks like an Apple store now. Yeah. Just white boxes. Right. Or maybe gray boxes. And it used to be that there were huge departments. Some The old line department stores in the early 1900s had huge shops because they really would put out these amazing displays that were very entertaining. They'd have carpenters, they have all of these people building all of this stuff. And it was quite the art form until AIDS hit. And when AIDS hit in 1981, we had a huge industry die off because there were a lot of gay men were these masters. The masters around me in the industry died. And the department stores just stopped hiring single men And that's when we saw the beginning of the end of the whole visual display thing. A lot of the work that I'm doing now as immersive environment was based on merchandising, was based on window shopping and that sort of thing. And now we create environments that people pay to go through and get their selfies. I never would have put together the AIDS crisis and the death of all of those people with the death of particular industries, but it absolutely makes sense. That would go hand in hand. You describe yourself as a maximalist. What does that mean to you? The only formal education I have is magic school. I had an incredible magic teacher. And from the time I was 14 to 20, I went to magic school. And to perform magic or design magic, the magician uses everything in his power to create the illusion or the magic, right? You're using a bunch of stuff that the audience doesn't know about. And you don't want them to know about it. It's just the stuff that you use to move your audience to the right place for that moment of magic to happen. So in magic, you use a lot of different languages. You use everything in the room that you can, whether it's the lighting and the tone, and the visuals, and the color, and the sound, and the foley. You're using everything you can to get to where you want to go. And that's what maximalism is to me. It's not just a bunch of stuff. A lot of people think it's just a preponderance of stuff. And it does use a lot of stuff. You're not a hoarder. You're deliberately layering things. Well, I am a hoarder. Let's not, you know, let's not go that far. (laughs) The being a hoarder is not the maximalist thing. Yeah, no, we, we hoard because we have to have an incredible palette to pull from. But we, because <laughs> right. we have to pull from that palette. Obviously, I have not designed escape rooms, but I, I would imagine that the process is similar in that you are saying, what are the objects that support my story? What are the colors that support my story? What are the textures that support my story? What are icons that trigger a memory for people? What has good DNA? Oh, no, PG, he figured out why he's here. (laughs) (laughs) Escape rooms basically at their best should feel like those wonderful window installations that we remember seeing as kids. There's wonder, there's fantasy, there's potential, there's promise in these, right? Except in an escape room, you get to walk through them. You get to pick up that box and see what pops out. And maybe what pops out is a puzzle piece that's an invitation for you to explore further. I think a lot of what you do, there's a lot of DNA in that in escape rooms nowadays. Right. It makes absolute sense. I truly believe that we have 
cellular memory of stuff. And somebody maybe has never seen a magic lantern slide, but when they see a magic lantern slide, I think that there's something in us that just the same thing with antiques, same things with real materials versus plastics, you know. What's a magic lantern slide? Oh, my gosh. Darling. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. Do you know what this is, David? <laughs> I'm Googling right now. See, you see, he didn't know either. He just didn't want to say. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, I, th this is so exciting. Okay. So it's early optics at the discovery of the persistence of vision which was, David, you'll know the date on this, where we discovered animation. Okay, so we're talking 1800s, right? There were these guys that would travel from town to town with their magic lanterns. And the magic lanterns were often arc light. 1848 is when this was first invented. Okay, so 1848 up until the 1930s. They still were using them in, in schools up till the 20s or 30s. But they're about four inches square. And it's like IMAX slides. They're glass slides that they would print or lithograph onto glass. A guy came to town and said, do you want to see Europe? And you would go into a theater and he would have this arc light driven lantern and he would show you Paris. And then he had things called chromothropes, which are geared glass slides that rotate oppositionally and create Victorian psychedelics. They're incredible. <laughs> so They're these wonderful. are early projection systems. Yeah. And they look almost like finished spirographs with vivid colors that they're swapping in. But it's also early photography and early hand colored photography. And you would see the savages from different countries. When you pick one of these up, you may have never seen one in your life, but you can still connect I think, to the people that were watching those things. I hope you get to visit Denver again. There's a huge collection in my next project, which is the Cabinet of Curiosities and Impossibilities at Marjorie Park, which is a sculpture park. It's getting its own little building. We have all these flat files. And when you open them up, we've got these backlit flat files. And you can see we have hundreds and hundreds of magic lantern slides. They're really fun to look at. Oh, very cool. I want to talk about your Christmas tree installations, the work that you did for Neiman Marcus in Dallas, because first of all, David made me watch a YouTube show with you creating these amazing Christmas tree installations. And I'll tell you, Lonnie, David has never once made me watch a YouTube video in preparation for an interview. He usually does all the research and all the stalking, and I just come on and I get to be surprised <laughs> by everything. So he did have me watch this. And they are pretty good at documenting the work that you did there and how unique all of these installations were. How would you describe these Christmas trees that you created for Neiman Marcus window displays? The tradition started in the 1930s, I believe, at the original store, Dallas uh, store number one. And there was this one window called the Palladian window. And it's just this huge arched window on the Hervé side of the building. It's two stories tall, right? The trees were always 15 and a half feet tall. So very tall window. And these are the days that Stanley Marcus was at the helm. And he was quite the showman. They would turn the entire store out exterior and interior into a country. They would turn it into Paris and then have Coco Chanel strut through the place. I mean, it was like, it was a wild. The family started by throwing parties in cities for general stores, sort of these Frank Baum type characters. That's how this Stanley and Marcus family started by throwing these big sales parties, merchandising parties in for retailers. And they invented ready-to-wear sizing. But anyway, so the family had made this money on the road. They had the choice of either buying a, a new beverage company or going into retail. And they say that they made the great mistake of starting Neiman Marcus uh, <laughs> instead of Coca-Cola. But anyway, they had this big window. But Stanley Marcus, if refrigeration was coming in and it was the latest technology, they would do a refrigerated tree that was all ice. Or one year it was fashionable to have furs back then, and they would make the entire tree out of foxtails. 
or they would they would do these lavish trees every year and then the tradition died out and then when Ignaz Gorshek who was vice president of visual and stores at the time saw my work at a trade show he says ah he says, I want to bring the trees back the crazy trees this guy's crazy enough to make crazy trees you inspired the return of the trees that's amazing so the first one was made out of a hundred years of light bulbs. So starting with a hand blown Edison light bulb. And the second one was the rear ends of classic automobiles. So I went finning at junk shops. 58 Cadillacs. Yeah. Oh God. The collector guys, they hated me. Lonnie, what's finning? Taking the fins off of classic Cadillac cars. Those 1950s. Cadillacs had those fins. They almost, if you think back to like the... They look like a shark tail, like two shark yeah, tails at the end. Exactly. Okay, I gotcha. So the second tree I made for them was completely out of taillights and fins from Cadillacs and a back end of an Impala. And then he sent me to confectionery school the next year to learn hot sugar. And I learned hot sugar and so did a tree out of blown and cast sugar the next year. He was realizing that we were getting a lot of airtime because of my antics out of these specials because <laughs> they were covering the guys in New York and L.A. and stuff. But because I would do these crazy things, we were getting some good airtime. So then he decided it'd be funny if I did an underwater tree out of blown glass and water all about the ocean, but that he wanted me to get my scuba license on camera. <laughs> and so we actually shot at 50 feet in a coral sanctuary. And I hate the waters so much, but I actually did it because it was television. So we did the ocean tree. We did a tree out of a million dollars worth of shredded U.S. currency. I think I remember watching that, the money tree one. Be I, yeah, I just, I. <laughs> that's so wild. You were at the forefront of reality TV also back then because you were on a lot of episodes of HGTV. Lonnie's World is a YouTube classic pilot that we cut, and we were this close to getting picked up by Discovery or HGTV, and an LA agent blew it, and we didn't get there. But I loved doing television. It was a lot of fun. There are three episodes of HGTV's Holiday Windows, that was the name of the show, that I believe you put up on YouTube. Yeah, sort of excerpts. Yeah. Uh-huh. I watched all of them. <laughs> These episodes all followed near identical story structures. Your client Ignaz sent you a FedEx package with a clue about the theme. You settled on a design after a draft or two were rejected. You did some research. You built. Something went wrong. You had a moment where it looks like your soul is leaving your body. And then you get the tree done just in time it all wraps with Ignaz telling you that he has an even more fun idea for next year. I'm curious how much of this was the structure that the TV show needed and how much of this was the structure of the client relationship. It started very honest and naive. And this was early in reality television. So this is 2001 to 2007. And originally it was shot documentary style. They would literally hang out with us for hours on hours while I was working on stuff. And we set up saying, okay, I'm going to blow a bunch of sugar today, or I'm going to cook a bunch of sugar today or whatever. And I think that I saw pretty quickly that when I did take a pratfall or something went wrong, we caught on very quickly in the first year that you tended to get the bumper before commercials. Uh -huh. You started to game this. Yeah, you got to get you started to game the cameras. The more mistakes <laughs> I made, the more bumpers I was getting. And the versions that are on YouTube are cut downs of, of my track. But those were hour specials. Those were hour long specials. And you also followed Macy's and you followed the other window dressers. We ended up with a finale in the first episode that we did. And then at that point, I think there was a little bit of structure by the producers of knowing that there had to be this arc. And I have to say, Ignaz is an amazing client, but you mentioned that moment that the blood runs out of my face and that I'm going to lose my soul. I, I like on the sugar. I don't know if you saw the sugar tree. Oh, I did. It looked like a hellish project. It was a hellish project. 
The other ones looked like they were challenging. The sugar tree looked like a miserable project. I was learning sugar in Denver, which has zero humidity. Yep. And then we had to go to Dallas. We had to drive everything down there. And we had to go to Dallas and cook in this fabulous million dollar kitchen, which was cool. But we had to use dehumidifiers and there was the humidity and everything. And we, I would literally walk out the door with a piece and it would just blow up in my hands because of the humidity. That moment when I dropped the hammer through the bottom four feet oh, no. of the tree, I was just getting it. We really were four hours out. And as I drop the hammer and it breaks up all of these huge sugar discs, that was the moment that they tested the drop curtain outside. <laughs> and so I make this mess. And the moment that I make this mess, the curtain drops from the window in rehearsal. <laughs> and Ignaz is on the other side of the window <laughs> looking at me with all of this broken sugar in my arms. So sugar surgery was for real. It looked it. I've been involved in enough client projects to know when like a catastrophe looks real. And that was the one that looked truly like an actual disaster that you were having to put back together. Yeah, I was truly scared. So, you know, I would think that by year six or seven, I know that by the time we got to the money tree, we were beginning to think about things that could go wrong. That makes sense. And they, I remember standing there and they'd given me this little hand device that I could have behind my back. And when I'm talking to Ignaz about the tree, because we had to put a glass railing around it because of federal laws and stuff, nobody could touch it, blah, blah, blah. And he was going to have me lean too hard on the glass railing and break a panel. And they gave me a little, one of those little devices, you know, to shock the glass. <laughs> You're doing stunt work now for this show. <laughs> We're having this conversation and I'm trying to be casual and I click and it doesn't break the glass and I click. <laughs> And the cameras are rolling and we're trying to be cool about this. And then I see out the corner of my eye, some construction worker that just kind of rolls his eyes and takes a hammer <laughs> off camera <laughs> and hits the, the pane of glass. Because <laughs> he was there with the next replacement pane of glass to put in. We're taking a moment to thank our sponsor, Morty. Morty is a free app for discovering, planning, tracking, and reviewing escape rooms, haunts, and other immersive social outings. And Morty is now available for all to use on its fantastic website experience, iPhone app, and its brand new Android app, available now on the Google Play Store. I believe in Morty so much that I have a stake in it as an advisor. The Morty Partner Dashboard enables escape room owners to respond to reviews, positive or negative. And this is something that every escape room owner should be doing on every platform that they receive ads, but especially on Morty, where the community is living. I think it's super important to stay on top of responding to reviews. Not only does it get you more visibility as being a part of the community, but you can also, you can respond to negative reviews. That changes a lot about how people feel about your experience if they get to hear directly from you. Positive reviews too. You know, people love hearing from the owner. They want to know that their voice was heard and that you are taking what they had to say into consideration. It feels wonderful as a reviewer to have my positive review responded to. And it also feels good to have a negative review responded to artfully. It really does help to pull me in and make me more engaged with that company. Yeah, I think a great response to a reviewer will turn them into your biggest champion. You can learn more at morty.app slash repod. That's R-E-P-O-D to sign up and get a special badge for our listeners. Link and details in the show notes. So in these episodes and in your work in general, you create with a ton of different materials and techniques. How much of that work is collaborative versus you learning the nuts and bolts of working in these new materials and techniques? There are some things that I do not have working knowledge of. I don't weld. I don't like wood saws. There are some things that I completely hand over. 
but I try to have a working knowledge. I have glass blowers blow glass. We always try to do winter's work where we cross train on something every winter on one form or another, one material or another. So I try to have some working knowledge. You can't break the rules unless you know them. It takes an army to build what I'm doing now. It used to be that we did everything. And it really was that we were costuming for a dance school one day and for kink the next. A lot of these skills were just developed because we needed them. Who's we in this case? My husband, Terry. We've been working together for 42 years. Wow. And it was the two of us. I try not to ask other people to do things that I wouldn't do. It does take a lot of people. I recently started my studio work again, and I'm personally making like bits for the cabinet. And I think that I'm trying to find a balance so that I still get to do some of it. Because pretty soon you're just managing 30 other people that are getting to make the art. Switching subjects, you created the evolution of the ball sculpture for Coors Field, where the Colorado Rockies play. How did that project come about? That was in 94, 95. And I was working on a cross-cultural symbology series of the circle, the triangle, and the cross. Uh, I was making hundreds and hundreds of little paintings, and I was trying to find the essence of each one of these shapes. I like the idea of taking a subject and then trying to exhaust that subject to find the whole. That was the premise. And it was a fairly serious body of art I was working on. And I was hanging out with a bunch of artists and the competition for the public art at the new baseball stadium came up and somebody made a joke and said, oh, Lonnie, you've been working on that circle series. Why don't you do a ball series? And we all had a good laugh about it (laughs) and went on my way. And then the next day or maybe even that night, that sculpture more or less came flooding at me and... I just was a maniac and started drawing all of the different balls and ended up with this sculpture, a sculptural gateway of terracotta and glass mosaic and steel and concrete that explores the evolution of the ball that has everything on it from a dung ball to Lucille ball to (laughs) Debbie ball to golf ball. All the balls. <laughs> All the balls. <laughs> All the balls. There's 108 balls on this sculpture. And it was my first public art sculpture. And it was a competition. I made the finals with drawings. And then they give you a little money and you build a maquette and go in. And I competed and got it. And I was just up. My hair was on fire. It was just one of those things that it was like I was so inspired. And I wanted it, man. I, w- I wanted that sculpture bad. So we got it. And then five years ago, there was a big development down on that land. The Rockies developed a big $220 million condo and retail development. And the sculpture was removed and taken off site. It's sitting in a back parking lot. So we've had some very interesting, what started as a fight and now is a respectful negotiation. It's still going on to get the sculpture back and get the sculpture put back to where it originally was. Good luck. I I hope that works out. (laughs) Yeah. I hope that comes to a respectful and positive conclusion. Yes. Very soon. I'm hoping. Buzzshot is escape room software powering business growth, player marketing, and improving the customer experience. They offer an assortment of pre- and post-game features, including robust waiver management, branded team photos, and streamlined review management for Yelp, TripAdvisor, Google Reviews, and Morty. Buzzshot now has integration with Repod sponsor Cogs for all of your technology needs. Buzzshot not only automates the hassle of asking your players to leave a review, it also has a review monitor feature that shows all of your reviews in one central place. You can even search reviews to quickly see which game masters are being mentioned and praised by name. 
Streamline your marketing and grow your escape room business. Repod listeners get an extended free trial and 20% off your first three months with no setup fees or hidden charges. Visit buzzshot.com slash repod. That's R-E-P-O-D to learn more. Link and details in the show notes. One of the other videos that David had me watch in preparation for this interview was about one of your earliest installations designing for the wizard's chest in Denver, which looked incredible. I would have died to have gone there when I was a kid. It is a toy magic puzzle and costume store with an incredible and playful aesthetic. It has Lonnie Hansen all over it. (laughs) What is the backstory on this? That was one of our first gigs. We still work with them 42 years later. Oh, so, so the store is still open. Oh yeah. Yeah. I know it's very popular. Next time you come to Denver, you've got to go. It's 60, it's 16,000 square feet. Now it started at 400 square feet. I'm planning on going. I'm sad I didn't realize it was a thing. I would have gone the last time I was in town. Yeah, it, uh, boy, talk about a labor of love. So I was bouncing around doing costumes and singing telegrams and stuff. And I went into this tiny little toy store. Betty Arca was the owner at the time. It has different owners now. And she was this mom that had a boy that was about to become a teenage boy. And she bought this toy store because she didn't feel like there were good, wholesome. It was the beginning of Dungeons and Dragons. And she wanted a toy store that her son could go to and nerd out. And David's familiar with those. (laughs) Nothing like this. Not at all. This is special. I stopped in and I said, you know what? You need a wizard out front. It was called the wizard's chest, but I said, you need a wizard standing out front. I'll go make you a wizard to stand out front. If you'll give me that rubber mask and give me 50 bucks, I'll go make you a wizard. And I did. And I took a female mannequin and patted it out and bound it. And we made a wizard robe and with a rubber mask and we stuck it out front. And lo and behold, it worked and her sales doubled and she was pretty happy the people in the toy business would say, okay, now it's this, now it's marbles, now it's Magic the Gathering, now it's whatever the thing, and she always s- stuck on it. So she doubled the size of the store, and then we moved her and doubled it again, and then moved her and doubled it again into her own building, and now it's 16,000 square feet on Broadway. I call it the department store of fun. There's a department called Cheap Thrills. It's joy buzzers and rubber worms and Whoopee you know. cushions, all like, the prank stuff. I love, oh, I love that stuff when I was a kid. The fake vomit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All that stuff. <laughs> when you're building an environment, whether it is a Christmas installation or an immersive toy store, how do you go about encouraging people to suspend their disbelief? Wow. I guess the first thing that came to mind was that I try to stay in a place as a designer of that 12-year-old, that prepubescent place. I figure if I load enough what I call pleasure buttons, if I load enough color and glitter, fantasy, and like I said, all that stuff, all the ingredients, I think people are looking for play. I think people are looking for joy, but we cut ourselves off from it. And so I think that I just try to use whatever it is. There's a cabaret, same family, actually. The son that grew up in the toy store then started a cabaret, which is now a fabulous burlesque cabaret in Denver, which I'd love for you to see that. I tried to design the cabaret that everybody thinks a cabaret is. It's not the cabaret that exists. There are no cabarets that exist that look like this. It's what we think a classic cabaret is going to look like and and has those ingredients in it. So maybe that's the way that I get others to suspend their disbelief is that I design to suspend mine first. That's how I feel looking at your work and taking in your creations is I feel like you have a remarkable talent for delivering on the fantasy of whatever it is that you're creating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, 
just feels right. Thank you. It's not a mystery that I had what you would call a wicked childhood. And the way that I coped with my childhood was fantasy and was art. When the clowns come out at the circus, when somebody has taken a fall to get the attention away from the guy that fell, the clowns come out to take the audience back. Mm -hmm. And so I think that what turned out to be a coping device for me is now because I think that everybody's a little injured. I try to create a safe space for people to recapture some kind of magic. You know, I did a little bit of haunted house stuff in the very beginning of my career, but it's like, there's no need for any more horror in our world from my perspective. So I'm always trying to bring people to that spot of innocence, I guess, when you're a kid and magic is still possible. I would say that is arguably a very difficult job. We hear a lot from escape rooms that they make horror rooms because it's easy to create an experience that instills fear in people. And I would argue it is a more difficult task to create something that delivers joy. But you really have managed to do that in Camp Christmas, which is where David and I got to experience your work firsthand. And there is a really kind of fantastical quality to it. I felt like I was in Edward Scissorhands or something. It felt really unreal being in these worlds. So <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about Camp Christmas, how it looks and how it works? What is it? It's a quirky romp through this thing that we call Christmas that's been going on for 5,000 years that we know of even long before it was called Christmas, where it's the time of year that it's cold and it's dark and we need a party. <laughs> and that's the core of the whole thing. We decided to do a place that was celebrating what the secular commonalities are of the season, because there are no religious iconography in the show. I had a huge collection of Christmas stuff, some of which we would buy back from Neiman Marcus, some that we had collected. We've been doing these displays for many years. We have animated displays that we built in the 80s, and we had a large collection. 2019 is when we first started this. That was the height of the first round of selfie palaces, as they were calling them, the Candytopia and the Museum of Ice Cream and that sort of thing. So we decided to do this selfie palace and put in a couple of bars. That led to a bigger and bigger operation. We're taking it back to the original location this year, but it's a walkthrough immersive environment that celebrates many different eras and mashups of eras of Christmas decorations and music and just sort of celebration. You collect Merry Badges is one of the gamifications of it. There are 20 Merry Badges. There are 23 pun trees that you can guess the pun of. And there are toasts that are posted throughout the walkthrough so you can toast your friends. And of course, we have Santa. But again, if we go back to the window display and department store and downtown stroll with your family as a tradition that used to be a thing in America, that's what we're, we're going back to that multi-generational family coming together, seeing something together, and hopefully walking away with the Christmas spirit. It feels magical, and I have been pretty open about my general dislike of the selfie palace because I think they're usually soulless. Mm -hmm. And Camp Christmas is brimming with soul because it feels like a wonderful world to inhabit that also happens to be a great place to take photos of yourself. Whereas I feel like selfie palaces usually feel like this artificial space where you just can go and take a whole bunch of photos that misrepresent everything that you're experiencing, <laughs> but you're actually experiencing things in Camp Christmas. Well, thanks. I hope so. We collect things from different eras and we, we've collected these different props for various reasons over the years. And so it is very eccentric. Lonnie, I'm shocked that you would make something eccentric. Eccentric. Can you imagine that? But I, I have a great crew. 
we call our crew magic makers. Many of these people are stylists that come from the retail world or come from the movie or television business. So we're just trying to make these environments that are believable and that you can step back and that you want the conversations to happen. You want the natural, what I call natural interactive to happen, right? And somebody says, oh, my grandma had one of those. And it's like, oh, that album. We've got Cher driving the big gold Baroque sleigh this year being pulled by the elk because she's going to drop a Christmas album in a few days. So that'll be... <laughs> um, yeah. It's amazing. So it sounds like everything that you do, every project that you work on, including, it sounds like, every inch of Camp Christmas is telling a story with objects. And one of the things, you know, we like to explore is environmental storytelling. This happens a lot in escape rooms. But how do you go about doing this? How do you make sure that these displays, these objects are telling a cohesive story without lines of dialogue? It's hard. It would be a lot easier if we could put actors and characters into that because you are, yeah, you're relying on objects I bet it's the same structure as, as great escape room designers are using. You think about era, you think about texture, color story. I can't say that enough. Color stories are extremely important. What does that mean? That means that you know what colors you're allowing in a space and what you're not. And a color story just... If I show you a palette of mid-century appliance colors, you know what that story is. Even if you don't know precisely what era it's from, you know it's not from the era you're in. Yeah, that's right. For instance, there's a tunnel that's all black light, and that's obviously, that's a color story. You come out of that into what I'm calling the Art Nouveau area, and that's all done in dusty pastels, and I don't let any primaries into that. It all feels like it should be Paris, 1890, Art Nouveau. And then the beauty camp... My favorite with the wigs, right? Right. Tell us about Beauty Camp. <laughs> Beauty Camp is about those outrageous headdresses in the 50s and 60s that women would like literally do these bouffants that were shaped like Christmas trees. And they'd put all these Christmas ornaments in their hair and all of that sort of thing. We have a very wonderful drag queen friend who led the shop for the invention. And they just made a beauty shop full of, I think we have 27 headdresses in this beauty shop where the color story comes in. In this case is that if you look at the mannequins, the mannequins are done in baby pink, baby blue, and seafoam green. And so are all the wig heads and all the furnishings and everything else. And so we use those 50s pastels to back up everything in that room. And then we've got all the other colors on top of that. But that helps bring the whole room together and also helps us with the representation of skin color. And that way we avoid that. There are a number of different spaces in Camp Christmas. You've just listed out a few of them. How do you go about working with different aesthetics and managing to make them all feel like they're still part of this singular whole? They all have this whole identity of their own, but then they feel like they fit together as well. Some of that is just that the same people are designing all the spaces and all the stuff. And so you get a consistency. There are a lot of rules sort of design rules around my work, how we use materials, how we use color, how we use graphics. Can you share a couple of the specific rules? Any that come to mind? The rules that come to mind are just the working rules, which are, you know, our number one is work like water because the creative process is just, you're always hitting a rock. And so we just remind ourselves to work like water the way that we work our way out of a scene, we always work from the back to the front and from the top to the bottom. We work our way, just like you work your way out of a painting, we work our way out of a, a room. And there are sort of layers of, there's the architectural layer and then the drapery layers and the fixtures and the chronology of objects. David Darling, who's my tech director, is wonderful. He introduced this whole rough lumber thing a couple of years ago. It was actually during the pandemic when we couldn't get lumber. And he was smart enough to find a logging group in Wyoming, I think, that were felling trees for the government. And we literally went and bought 
600 trees. And wow, with the bark on them, and it allowed us to build all the fencing and all of it. So we leaned into a rough aesthetic so that there's a background that things are made out of the rough wood and then the juxtaposition of these beautiful rhinestone encrusted displays floating on top of this very rough exterior. And then, of course, the graphics and signage. We're very careful about color. Again, typography, all of that sort of stuff. So all the signage and icons. And that's one way to keep it really consistent. It's fantastic. You mentioned the pun trees. Can you tell us a little bit about how that works? Because I adored this concept. <laughs> it's, it's so much fun. It actually started, it was one of those projects that started at Neiman Marcus. We did a thing called Uncle Acorn's Miraculous Arboretum. <laughs> <laughs> because Stanley Marcus, again, one of the founders of Neiman Marcus, would talk about an acorn. And how an acorn can be just an acorn or an acorn can be a great oak tree. But it's about how you value things and look at things and how you grow things, right? We did this exhibit for the 95th anniversary in the store number one because it's a huge store. It's a nine-story building. So we had room to do these exhibits. And it was a walkthrough of pun trees. In their case, it was like it started with a shoe tree that was made out of all Manolo Blahniks. It was like the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. So that's where the gag got started. And so when we did the first year of Camp Christmas, I think we had 12 pun trees and they're all ending in T-R-Y or sometimes T-R-E-E, -E, but most often T-R-Y. They're at like a Christmas tree with ornaments that are different objects on them, like themed objects on a tree. And you have to guess that's right. what the pun is. Okay. And the puns are like pantry, but it's covered in little pan figures. Frying pans. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Actually, no, these are like pan from mythology. There's a puppet tree that's decorated in marionettes. I love the dentist tree. There's dentistry. There's gum tree. There's podiatry, which is iPods and eyeballs and pods. <laughs> So we started getting crazier and crazier. I think the funnest one last year was Roger Daltrey, which was covered in dolls that were all Rogers. So Roger Ebert and Roger Rabbit and <laughs> all the famous Rogers. This year we're adding um, idolatry. You should do carpentry and have it covered with cars and pens. <laughs> yeah, and carp. And carp. Yes, we have it. We have a carpentry. So anyway, yeah, we've had a lot of fun. But I'm beginning to run out of puns because we're up to 23 now. So. People are allowed to carry drinks through Camp Christmas. Does this mm -hmm. ever cause problems? Yeah, of course it does. <laughs> There's a lot of spilled hot chocolate. And you know what? In making the, the displays, I don't know if you noticed, there were not a lot of ropes and stanchions. And I don't put a lot of glass in front of my work. And I don't overly protect my work. If somebody's going to be an asshole, somebody's going to be an asshole. But why do we prepare for everybody to be an asshole if only 1% is going to be? I've seen people that don't trust their audience and they put up all that stuff and they have the same level of damage. And I'm sure the escape room people are just going to pound me on this. No, I don't think so. It's funny because the prevailing logic with a lot of escape room designers is that you just make everything into the tankiest version of the thing that you can make. And I think that there is some truth to that. But I also know that you talk to people like Chris Latner who make these incredibly detailed environments and there are elements of what he makes that I think are a bit fragile. And he has said to me that when things look expensive, people behave more gently and when things look like they can take a beating, they behave a little bit more belligerently. Yes. I think it's similar to hostile architecture, people putting spikes in the middle of benches and stuff. Yeah. I think that if you put it out there, the audience is going to notice it. And if that is bulletproofing, if you bulletproof everything, then everybody says, okay, it's bulletproof. And therefore, yes, I think they are tougher on something that they think is bulletproof. and. You know what it's like. It's like. I've had the great occasion of going into some very fancy places in my life. And it's like when you go into a very fancy place, you put your hands behind your back and you respect that place. And I think that if you give the audience the respect, I think that they'll be pretty good about it. 
we'll make little signs that say, you know, Santa's watching and keep your admittance to yourself and stuff like that, <laughs> that we might put in places that we see that kids keep on going after or something. But I don't know. I think a lot of this immersive work, whether it's escape rooms or whether it's the immersive theater stuff that we're trying to do, we run into social contracts over and over again. And the world knows what a social contract is when you go to the movies, hopefully, or you go to theater. People know social contracts and they know how to behave when they've been taught how to do those things. And I would find it interesting. David, can you tell me, as the escape room audience has matured, do you think it's actually gotten better? Do you think people have a better understanding of what their social contract is when they go into an escape room now? My general observation has been that there is always this tiny percentage of people who are always going to do damage or are going to choose violence. Mm -hmm. But my impression is that there is an escape room owner who I'm friends with on Facebook and I've known for many years. And I feel like something is going horribly, terribly wrong in this person's escape room every week. It is just like a constant barrage of barbarians just running through. And what I keep trying to ask myself, and over the years, I thought that this person's problems were fully representative of what everyone else was dealing with. And then I've spoken to a lot more owners in a lot of detail about the kind of damage that they deal with. And I have never spoken to another owner who deals with as much strife and chaos as this one individual does. And so my more recent visits there, I started asking myself, what is going on here? And I think that there are things in the way that they design their games, in the way their games play, in the way that their game masters communicate and communicate to their customers that are saying, this is a place to be a jerk. If you are doing a lot of hiding, if you're encouraging your players to do a lot of searching and destructive searching where they have to pull the drawers out entirely, something's hidden behind the back of a drawer or underneath the seat cushion, you are rewarding them for destructive behavior, right? So that's going to carry forward. And I do think a lot of the trend has been moving away from that. They're gating the stuff that you're finding a little bit better. So you are not rewarding players for basically turning the entire room upside down. <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot of the design trends have shifted away from things that cause a lot of damage. They've gotten rid of lots of small, intricate pieces. They're not hiding things everywhere. Hiding tiny things all over the place encourages everyone to get up in every single nook and cranny, and that's never good for a set. Most things are glued down nowadays, so you're, you're not able to move stuff all around. I think there's a little bit of they're designed and built better. They're designed and built smarter. And then a lot of companies figured out how to communicate respect to their guests and get respect in return. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I just think that it's going to continue to be tricky, but I think you're right. I think that whole communication and what kind of expectations you're setting up listen, I know that if I leave a carousel horse out in the middle of a room, that somebody's going to put their kid on the seat of the carousel horse. Yep. It's begging for it. It's begging for it. Now, how do I solve that? I put some really beautiful, fake, and very spiky evergreen branches on the saddle and put an arrangement up there on the saddle. I think some of it is that you've got to anticipate certain moves. If you, like you said, if you've designed something that is encouraging them to make a move, then you need to think that through. That's a better approach than a sign that says, please don't sit here, which just feels... Just begs you to sit down. You know? Well, and nobody wants to feel lectured at. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, I hate going yeah. into escape rooms where there's a 20 minute monologue by the GM of you're going to see this. You're going to want to sit on it. Don't sit on it. There's this thing there. Please don't touch it. It's been broken twice this week. It's like there's ways to get around the lecture and the signage. <laughs> Lonnie, everything that you have been doing centers on joy and centers on sparking this childlike 
exuberance in both children and adults. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to hear, what does Camp Christmas mean to you? I truly think that if it's got a good medicine, which means that somebody takes a rekindled look, I like the re's a lot, remember, rekindle, revive, reset, relive, that if they find some re and they reevaluate their relationship, I mean, who doesn't have a a love-hate relationship with Christmas? I mean, really, come on. It's this major deadline that no matter what your creed, is the deadline of the year. Yeah, very stressful. A lot of people probably find Christmas extremely stressful. It can be very stressful. It can have some really rough emotions to it. There's so many expectations to it. So when the medicine is delivered and somebody has come out of the experience by saying, when my friends were dragging me to this thing, I was like, bah humbug. But you know what? I found a new view. Or I found a new joy. You converted a cynic. Yeah, we converted a cynic. I I will never forget getting a letter from a guy who admitted that he was like this really strict, cold father to his children. And that after going through Camp Christmas, found himself making forts with his kids and actually participating joyfully. Oh, that's wonderful. And man, oh man, you know. A, for him to have the guts to like admit that. And that's the mission. That's the, you know, I think most of us in this business are not just in it for the fame and fortune (laughs) because it's a really rough business. It's a really tough business to be in. We're in it to feel like we can not change lives, but change a moment anyway, or change a day or change a season for somebody just reconnecting people to it. It's still there. It's just like you said, fear is so easy. Well, fear is also really prevalent. We have a society that is just, oh my gosh, I can't turn on anything without somebody being nasty or somebody being upset or angry or violent. And I just, you know, it is a lot of work to try to get onto the civilized side of it. It is much more work to design joy than to design hate. Hate is easy. Yeah. I'm grateful you are here creating moments of joy. And I am so thankful that you came on the podcast to share it with us. If you're interested in Camp Christmas, it is running this year, November 16th through December 24th, 2023 at the Stanley Marketplace in Aurora, Colorado, which is just outside of Denver. I highly recommend that you go. It is beautiful. It is joyous. It's a great place to have some hot chocolate and to take a few selfies and to (laughs) re-whatever. Lonnie, are there any other projects that you're currently working on that you'd like to share? Uh, Sure. We're working on, I mentioned it earlier, the Cabinet of Curiosities and Impossibilities, which is a Cabinet of Curiosities that contains the fairy tale relics. So we actually have Miss Muffet's Tuffet. We have Little Red's Riding Hood and many other artifacts that have been collected through the Grimm's and the Anderson and Mother Goose tales. And that's going to open this winter. And then next spring, there's an immersive play called Impossible Things that'll be produced by the Catamounts Theater Company. And that will take place in and around the cabinet of curiosities at the Marjorie Park Sculpture Garden at Fiddler's Green here in Colorado. So that's very exciting. There is a project that you can see right now for the next few days at the Beverly Hills Neiman Marcus, another one of my trees, and that's running right now. And then we just pitched a whole bunch of projects at the Immersive Immersive, which DCPA is hosting, and uh, got to pitch my dreams for my next projects, including an escape room Airbnb called Bosco, the magician's apartment, that the game and experience design is going to be done by Cody Borst. Phenomenal. We're going to be asking you more about that in the bonus episode. (laughs) 
Thank you so much. I highly encourage everybody to check out Lonnie's work, especially if you're in the Denver area. And Lonnie, what is the best way for people to follow or connect with you and your work? Probably on the Instagram or the Facebook. Those are probably the easiest places. Lonnie, thank you so much for joining us. I have only met you a few times, but every single time I have had some of the most interesting and honest conversations. <laughs> and I love talking to you and hearing about your work and hearing about the adventures and the stories. It has been so much fun getting to know you. And I, I can't wait to uh, meet up again in person. Oh, same here. It's been great talking to you guys. Thank you so much for having me. The Reality Escape Pod is produced by Teresa Piazza with support by Lisa Spira. We're edited by Steve Ewing of Stand Inside Media, music by Ryan Elder, logo by Janine Proct, and all of this is brought to you by RoomEscapeArtist.com, your home for well-researched, rational, and reasonably humorous escape room and immersive gaming content and events. You've made it to the end of the episode. I'm guessing that you had a good time because otherwise you would have bailed. How about you go and take that good time straight over to Spotify or Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. Help other people find what we're doing. It really helps us out. And think about who you just helped out by helping them find a podcast that they're really going to enjoy. Go do it. Do it now. Thank you. Well, folks, it is that time. You know exactly the one I'm talking about. It's the one where the desperate content creator tells you, please, please join our Patreon, please. I know you hear it from everybody, but it means so much to us. The amount of time and energy and money that we put into producing shows like this to the degree that we produce them and all of the other things that we're doing, it just takes a lot. And our patrons, every single one of them matters at every single level. So if you have the money available and it's not gonna be a hardship for you, please consider backing us on Patreon. And if it is gonna be a hardship, please don't. And backing us at the $5 level gets you access to the RIA Discord, and it also gets you our bonus after show. The show goes on for like another 40 to 50 minutes usually. A lot of times we have the guests joining us. I mean, that's, that's longer than that cup of coffee will last you. At the $15 level, you also get access to our Spoilers Club. Here, we take deep dives into iconic, well-known escape rooms, and we're joined by the creators who come in and gives us exclusive behind-the-scenes, director's cut-style commentary. This is some of my favorite content to produce because I love talking about escape rooms in full. You can learn more at patreon.com slash roomescapeartist link in details in the show notes a little charming story from one of my light shows a thing i did called hudson holiday many years ago there was this light display it was an outdoor light show walkthrough and there was a light display that i had done called castle on the hill and it was just these lights that were shaped into different turrets of a castle and we had mounted them on a grove of trees from a distance, it looked like there was a castle up on the hill. And one of my showrunners called me one night and said, Lonnie, I just, I have to tell you what I just witnessed. There's this mother pushing a stroller, but she's also got like a, like a little three-year-old, four-year-old girl walking with her. And I see them come down the lane and the little girl sees the castle on the hill and just exclaims and starts running towards the castle on the hill and the mother's like oh darling darling no 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 come come back here we'll get there in a minute and the little girl stops and turns to her mother and says i'm sorry i can't and and, and then turns and runs towards the towards the <laughs> castle and it was just like yes got him you know I, i've ruined another child <laughs> There, there, there's nothing like that. I'd say that I count my success in nose prints and fingerprints, you know? There's nothing like that moment when you see it in a kid's eyes. 